Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to Egypt. I would like to uh, welcome all of you to our mask ultrasound Zoom meeting. And I'm so happy that uh, Dr. Adham agreed to give a lecture today. I know he's very busy in spite of the uh, COVID in Egypt. I think the COVID is scared of him. So <laughs> he's, uh, he's here with us. And uh, Dr. Adham is the president of the Egyptian Society of Musculoskeletal and Neuromuscular Sonography. And he is also a ULAR uh, accredited trainer for MSUS. And uh, he has been organizing a lot of ultrasound workshop in Europe and also in that part of Egypt. And uh, I met him for the first time. Is that three years ago, Dr. Adam? That was three years uh, ago, four years ago. Uh, less than that, maybe two, two years, maybe? Two yeah. years and a half? Yes. Yeah, okay, two years. And I was very happy to be able to see the beautiful country of Egypt. I was so amazed with all this, uh, uh, Pyramids, and of course, the food is really great. So for those of you who are thinking about going to Egypt, you should go because it's one of the places that you should really, really see the beautiful country of Egypt. And I'm so glad that uh, uh, we were able to work together. And I think by next year, if all of, of all of this will be okay now, then we, we can resume our workshop there, Dr. Adham. And so I'm sure. so happy to, uh, to welcome Dr. Adam. He's actually a rheumatologist uh, slash uh, uh, sonologist, MSK, sonologist, a musculoskeletal practitioner. So he's so competent in teaching us a lot of this information that he, he's going to present today. So before we begin, let us just pause for a moment for a short prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, O oh God, for you have given us this opportunity to listen to Dr. Adham as he shared to us his expertise in ultrasound. Give him the wisdom that he needs. Help him, O oh God, to uh, share to us information that will help our patients. Make everybody safe forever we are, O oh God. And thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Dr. Adham... It's all yours. Thank you very much, Jackin, for the great uh, presentation and introduction. I really had the pleasure to meet you here in Egypt. Uh, we had a very, very uh, successful international two-day course, and you were really informative. And then you continue to do this all over the world, in America, in Asia, and a lot of other schools. It is really a great honor to participate uh, in a small part of your great activities. Hopefully, after the COVID uh, era, uh, we will host you back again with uh, uh, larger even events. So thank you very, very much for this uh, uh, introduction and uh, invitation. Uh, today, for everyone, good afternoon or good morning if you come from the Middle East. Um, I want you to relax, prepare your coffee, ice cream, water, whatever, and we will go through a very, very and the uh, calm journey uh, in the in thesis part. Uh, why I say this? Because every time we are uh, giving a talk or a course about uh, spondylo or about something, we come across this in thesis and every time I tell the doctors, one day I will talk to you about it, one day I will tell you all the details. So today is the day. <laughs> so prepare and uh, you can... Um, um, uh, keep your questions. You can send it to Jaikin directly. You can chat, send it uh, through the chat. You can wait until the end and uh, probably my friend will unmute you and allow you to interact. So feel free. Um, so the agenda for today will include the definition function structure of normal in thesis and then the importance of enthesis in rheumatology, how is abnormal enthesis looking like in this ultrasound, acute and chronic enthesiopathy, 
and even if we have the time, the differential diagnosis of the um, uh, enthesopathy and enthesitis. Uh, the ultrasound scoring for enthesitis and how to use it for monitoring different therapies. This is the slide zoom for the presentation today. So as you can see, don't be <laughs> confounded by the small number of slides. Each slide will form a section by time. So to take it slowly, slowly from the basic level, we will start to define what is enthesis. It is the insertion of tendons, ligaments, and joint capsules in the bone. This is known as enthesis. Also, enthesis will form a structurally continuous gradient from uncalcified tendon to the calcified bone. So it is a transient zone between soft and hard. Let's concentrate on the image on the left side, the normal joint. We want to see this is the bone, the other bone, the articular cartilage, the soft tissue, uh, the higher line uh, articular cartilage, and then the lining synovium of the capsule, ligament, and tendon in thesis is here. This is normal. In a disease like RA synovitis, you will find that the primary issue is happening in the synovium with secondary affection of the uh, in thesis, and then you might have also some erosions. While in enthesitis primary diseases, the psoriatic, the spondylo, or the spondylo in general, you will find primary enthesitis affecting periarticular, ligamentous, capsular, and tendinous insertion with only secondary affection in the synovium, if any. Especially early in the disease, that you might not necessarily find this. But also to give a little bit of complication, we will also talk about some enthesis that are not near the joints. Take this example, which are very, very important. Achilles enthesis, plantar uh, uh, fascia enthesis, lateral epicondyle enthesis, what we used to tell before uh, when affected a tennis elbow, uh, uh, well, that's changed now. So, and the spine in thesis, those in thesis don't come very, very close to the synovial joints like the others. So it's very important to appreciate both types. So what would be the function of this in thesis? First of all, it is the attachment of this tendon or ligament to the skeleton. Also in case of the capsule, it's the enclosure of the joint. So it's very important to attach tightly and prevent uh, any leakage from the joint. The transmission of contractile forces in case of ligaments and tendons, it's very important when it works, when it contracts to move the bone. So we want to transmit the contraction from the muscle to the skeleton, to the bone, so that we perform a movement. Also, it is very important to do this while dissipating the mechanical forces. Why? Because the accumulation of the stress forces in the enthesis might be four times greater than the tendon mid substance. So we need to uh, a little bit alleviate this uh, 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 mechanical forces as well and dissipate and spread to the skeleton. Now, uh, to go a little bit uh, closer and closer to the ultra anatomy, think about this bone and this tendon here to go through this part. This part is a plug, is a plug immediately adjacent to the bone. And there is either only fibrous tissue or fibrocartilaginous tissue. So first of all, don't confuse. We have two types of enthesis, either fibrous or fibrocartilaginous. In both cases, this fibrous or fibrocartilaginous part will intervene between the soft tendon and the hard bone. So the, the tendon is not directly related to the bone, but there is a plug here that, that is the enthesis. Now, uh, we will concentrate on the fibrocartilaginous enthesis because it's the most important clinically and the more complicated histologically. So think about this uh, wire as the tendon and this metal plate as the bone. So this area here will have a plug that helps to uh, transform from a soft tissue to a very hard tissue. 
So it's an intermediate tissue in the middle. Remember that uh, this is the only thing that we are not going to discuss in huge details today, but we cannot really overrule this. The immune role of enthesis. Later in this presentation, you will know enthesis is an organ. Enthesis is important. Uh, it, is, it comes in a close entity uh, of uh, synovium. So there's something called synovio-enthesial complex. It is very important mechanically, but also important in autoimmune diseases. So enthesis is an immune organ. Um, first of all, it seems to be uh, uh, activated uh, by in, uh, innate immunity because usually in the beginning there is an absent T cell activation, absent autoantibodies. So it works through the innate immunity predominantly. Also, uh, it seems there is a, 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 a major correlation between mechanical stress uh, and in thesis, and then in the sopathy and in the situs. Why? How can you prove this? A lot of things. First of all, we have the in thesis of the lower limb most affected. Second, we have a correlation between one of the score systems of in situs, like we are going to explain later, and the BMI. The, the so uh, for a little bit of obese patients would have uh, more abnormalities in the lower limb in thesis and a lot of other factors we will come across. Also, mechanical unloading, uh, for example, in the animal studies of mice, when we have Achilles tendinitis and we have done mechanical unloading, uh, this will reduce the enthesitis. And this is only natural because, for example, when we have enthesitis in young people of the uh, Osgood Schlatter, for example, in the knee, rest is a major uh, um, uh, way of healing uh, or, and treatment. We have to mechanically unload those in thesis. <clears throat> One of the axes of immunity that we need to understand, the release of prostaglandin E2, which is uh, uh, believed to be the early mediator, and uh, it has an excellent response because this enthesitis has an excellent response to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. This will support this uh, theory that the prostaglandin E2 is an early mediator. This will cause vasodilatation. After this will happen neutrophil recruitment from the close by bone marrow because of the uh, um, uh, close proximity between the enthesis, which is supposed to be a vascular, and this close by bone marrow. Due to the vasodilatation, those neutrophils will be recruited and will cause uh, nearby enthesial compartment inflammation and the bone marrow will, as, will seem inflamed and edematous. This is what appears in the uh, MRI. This is of course a very provisional and uh, primitive uh, image of how things develop. Uh, also think about uh, these uh, two axes for the activation of the immune system in the enthesis. The one that goes through innate immunity, prostaglandin E2, vasodilatation, recruitment of the cells, release of the TNF, and then the interleukin-17 will continue the case through uh, enthesitis. This is very important because we say this is interleukin-23 independent pathway of interleukin-17 activation meaning that this pathway of interleukin-23 leading to interleukin-17 is not the only case of activation of interleukin-17. Why do you care so much about interleukin-17? Because we found that interleukin-17, even more than the TNF, is the major entity that, uh, that activates or plays a mediator role in the activation of enthesitis, especially in the spondyloarthritis of all types. So it includes psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. Yes, you have the TNF in a smaller degree in all three diseases, but you have the interleukin-23 only in uh, psoriatic arthritis and less in, uh, and, and probably not so much in. Uh, uh, here is the secret why, because if we study the enthesis in the spine and the peripheral enthesis, there is quite difference between both. In the peripheral enthesis, there is also uh, a close by, uh, there is always a close by synovium 
related to this avascular enthesis. And this synovium either lining a bursa or a joint or a tendon or a nearby fat pad, those are all, all lined by synovium. And this is the synovium enthesial complex that we will speak about. The first thing we notice that this synovium enthesial complex does not exist in the spine. This is one. And second, when we look at the ultrastructure and the anatomy, we notice those myeloid cells that are very deficient in the spine and very abundant in the synovium enthesial uh, enthesis in the peripheral skeleton. Uh, and this is very important because it's the release, uh, the, it's the one able to uh, synthesize the inflammatory mediators and interleukin-23. Uh, and probably this is one of the reasons why the interleukin-23 inhibitors are not very effective in the ankylosing. I don't want to go through a deep immunity, otherwise I will lose your interest. But I want to share, uh, this is maybe the last slide, so don't be uh, so pessimistic about it. Uh, this is for the psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Uh, it is believed that the, the skin psoriasis is the originating, uh, or the inflammation would originate there, activating the innate macrophage and then activating the T cells. And as you notice, this T cell will be wandering all the way between the skin, the bone, uh, the enthesis, and the bone marrow. Uh, it will always have this T cell and the TNF activation with the pre-mediators. Now, uh, um, this interaction of the T cells and then the inflammatory mediators can explain how things uh, develop and probably explain about 70% of psoriasis patients because it, they start beginning in the psoriasis. After that, they develop the psoriatic arthritis, but it will not be uh, the whole theory. That's why I did not want to go through the full immunological response because about 30% of those uh, 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 psoriasis patients uh, will, will develop either at the development of psoriatic arthritis or maybe after even. Anyways. Let's talk about the normal enthesis. What is the normal enthesis? How would it look like? First of all, the enthesis would have the terminal tendon, the enthesis itself, and the cortical bone from the uh, attachment. So for the, for the tendon, it has to have fibrillar echostructure. This is the tendon. It has fibrillar echostructure, as you can see. And you can see one to two millimeter from the cortical bone a diffuse line here, so it's a black line. If I enlarge this, you can see now one millimeter of a black line here. This is the enthesis, and this is the tendon, and the hyperechoic line here is the bone. So what is the black line representing? It is presenting the obliquity and the anisotropy of the tendon. Yes, okay, but this is not all. It also represents the fibrocartilage of the enthesis. And here comes the importance of this fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage in the fibrocartilaginous enthesis is a major issue we will talk about in some details now. The margins are well-defined and regular. This bone is very well-defined and regular. And the corresponding tendon also shares the same thickness, the same echogenicity as the tendon. So the tendon and the distal tendon inserting here. Okay, this is how the enthesis would look like. Now, uh, the subenthesial bone cortex should exhibit sharp hyperechoic as image as we are always suggesting and expecting. And uh, that there is no Doppler signal in the enthesis itself. The enthesis itself is completely avascular, but there might be a nearby the, uh, Doppler for one feeding vessel adjacent to the enthesis, and by experience, you will know that this feeding vessel is uh, existing in most people, normal enthesis, and you will get used to it. And the number of in very important fibrocartilaginous enthesis in the body are somehow limited. So we will study these uh, uh, in the practical courses and get used to how this uh, feeding vessel would look like. And we will know that this is not here in the emphasis itself, okay?
as you can see, we are going fast forward in some areas. We are now heading to the middle of this uh, presentation. The structure of the MP says, I want to tell you if this is the radius and this is the pronator teres, this is how the fibrous tissue would look like. So bone and then the fibrous tissue in between uh, of the tendon and the bone. So this is easy. But look at this one between the tendon and the bone. There is this area or island of fibrocartilage, and it will be an ossified fibrocartilage towards the bone side and unossified fibrocartilage towards the tendon side. So if you take it this way, this is the tendon, this is the bone, this is the island in the middle, which forms the fibrocartilaginous in thesis, and you will find partly calcified and partly uncalcified of this fibrocartilage. Of course, the calcified part will be closer to the bone. So if we put it here and we want to look at the emphasis, you will find the first thing that attaches, uh, attracts your vision is this tide line or tide mark. Why do we call it tide mark? Because it's a very sharp line. What do you think? Is this the line between the tendon and the bone? No, because we said there is some structure that is present between the tendon and the bone. That is the emphysis. In this case, it's a fibrocartilaginous emphysis. Furthermore, the fibrocartilage is divided into uncalcified fibrocartilage and calcified fibrocartilage. So the line in this area will form the tide mark, the sharp outline between the uncalcified fibrocartilage related to the tendon and the calcified fibrocartilage related to the bone. So this is the tendon, uncalcified fibrocartilage, calcified fibrocartilage, bone. The tide mark is between the calcified and uncalcified fibrocartilage. <clears throat> So to explain again, we have this area of the tendon attaching directly to the bone where we have in the CL fibrocartilage. But we also having this fibrocartilage greener in color, in color attached to the bone, to, sorry, to the tendon, and it's called sesamoid fibrocartilage. And this bluer fibrocartilage attaches to the bone and it's called periosteal fibrocartilage. So to complicate things, the fibrocartilage are three types. The fibrocartilage that is directly related to between the tendon and the enthesis and the bone is called enthesial. But the more important ones are the sesamoid fibrocartilage that is uncalcified related to the tendon and the periosteal fibrocartilage, which is ossified related to the bone. Why is this important? Because there is a, a fine space in between that allows the encroachment of the synovium. In this case, is a fat pad lined by synovium. It could be a bursa lined by synovium. Could be a lining of a joint or a tendon lined by synovium. And this is where the synovio-enthesial complex comes handy. And this is, but this part can get inflamed and vascular, and it is responsible for the uh, blood vessels that we see later in inflammation. Okay, so let's come to how the normal enthesis would look like by ultrasound. So anatomically, this is uh, the knee and we put it in 30 degree flexion to examine. Everyone knows this. This is the femur, this is the tibia, cruciate ligaments, patella, suprapatellar fat, quadriceps tendon insertion in the patella, patellar tendon proximal part insertion in the patella and distal part insertion in the tibia. The Hofa fat pad, and this is the intraarticular space here. And to translate this here, this is a quadriceps tendon insertion in the patella, and this is the enthesis, suprapatellar fat, this is the femur, suprapatellar recess, and this is the intraarticular space. So this is the normal quadriceps tendon insertion. While the patellar tendon in thesis would look like this. This is the patella. This is the proximal attachment of the patellar tendon in the patella. 
this is the Hoffa fat pad, and this part is interarticular. And by the way, the Hoffa fat pad is another example of synovial lined fat pad because it is lined by synovium. This is very important, and we have this case of synovitis. So if you are asking, where does the Doppler signal in synovitis come from? It is from the lining synovium. The joint synovium lines the Hoffa fat pad. This is uh, the normal patellar enthesis. This is the distal patellar enthesis in the tibia. This is the tibia. And this is the patellar tendon insertion, inserting into the patella. And you can also appreciate this one millimeter of anechoic enthesis forming or having fibrocartilage. The other important one is the Achilles, so the patient is lying uh, like this, and we have the probe longitudinal fashion parallel to the patella, uh, sorry, parallel to the Achilles while inserting in the calcaneus. These are pre-insertional fibers, and this is the Achilles insertion here. So this is the tendon, pre-insertional fibers, insertional fibers, enthesis is here, pre-enthesis is here. So here we have fibrocartilage, in and fibrocartilage, but here we have fibrocartilage, sesamoid related to the tendon, and periosteal related to the bone, and you have also uh, a synovial lined bursa here. So uh, this is also an example of a close by synovium. This is very, very important in the peripheral emphasis in the skeleton. The last one, which is very, very important, is the plantar fascia, which forms also uh, um, a form of enthesis in the calcaneal bone, and this is the originate, originating plantar fascia going proximal, uh, going, uh, sorry, ah, uh, yes, going to the uh, toes, and this is the proximal attachment of the uh, plantar fascia. It's another example of uh, an important enthesis. So, you told us about enthesis organ and synovial enthesial complex. What is this about? Now, uh, Michael Benjamin, I had the honor to meet him. He, he is now dead uh, two years ago. And I had the chance to meet him several times in uh, Barcelona and even in uh, his hometown and uh, where he teaches in the anatomy section uh, in Wales. And uh, we had the chance to learn from him this concept. Starting 80s and 90s, he started to talk about in thesis, studying the prototypes in animals and then in humans, and doing this ultra anatomy or the histology, the slides, and uh, explaining what happens. Uh, the in thesis organ is a big concept uh, that explains that the in thesis is not only this area, but it's a unit or an organ that has also the related bursa, the synovial lined fat pads, a larger segment of the tendon, not this tendon only, but also a larger segment of the tendon, proximally, uh, and the fibrocartilage, the subchondral bone, and some nerve and blood supply to these areas nearby. And uh, in this concept, this will explain why some enthesopathies will have symptoms affecting immediately adjacent area rather than just the tendon, ligament, or bone junction itself. What does this mean? Meaning, some people, when you press here on the bone, on the enthesis, they will have the pain or the tenderness, but some people will still have some pain proximally. Why? Because of the involvement of these structures and interaction between them uh, in the enthesis organ. So this is very, very important to study. And then the other important uh, thing to study is the synovial enthesial complex. And as you can see also, it is uh, also Dennis and Michael Benjamin who have this idea. So you have this bone, uh, this bone, and this tendon inserting here. Then the lining synovium of the joint will be in close proximity of the, this tendon insertion and enthesis here. This is very important. And as I told you, in the peripheral skeleton, always look for the synovial enthesial complex. This will explain a lot of findings in the, uh, in the, in the patients. Okay, 
And this uh, uh, vascular emphysis will depend on the nearby synovium for nourishment even. But not only this, it will also depend on it for the inflammation. And in other words, the inflammation of the emphysis or the trauma even can induce inflammation in the nearby synovium. And this is partly, only partly, that explains why we find synovitis uh, earlier because it's supposed to be the primary lesion in spondylo even before the development of synovitis. So this is an, an, other, an other example where you have a synovial lined versa will cause in, uh, inflammation and Doppler signal in the tendon and the development of this erosion with a blood, uh, with a blood uh, Doppler positive in the emphysis. This is Achilles tendon and it's inserted here. So this is very, very typical. Okay, someone will tell me there is also some functional emphysis and not only uh, the normal fibrocartilaginous emphysis we know about. What is this functional emphysis? Well, we found out that at areas where tendons get in close proximity of the bone and there might be some friction between them, the bone develops or the body develops the same structure of the enthesis at this area, although that the tendon is not going to insert in this area. Why? Because we have a a cross section or a friction between the tendon and the bone. So this will enlighten us that this area will function as an thesis owing to the structures found in this area rather than the function of insertion. So the tendon will insert later, but at this area there is a friction and we need to do the modification. So what is the modification? At places where the tendons come in vicinity of the bone, there will be a, a pulley or a retinaculum holding this and a fibrocartilage present on the under surface of the tendon in contact with the bone. So this enthesis developed the same structure like the insertion, but there is no insertion. And this will explain why we have some changes here, the same as before. The same as explained by fibro uh, cartilaginous enthesis before. <clears throat> so the functional enthesis are prone to the same pathological process that real enthesis could lead to tenosynovitis of the tendon and dactylitis. In general, the role of functional enthesis and tendonitis and overuse injuries is overlooked. Nobody looks here. When you have the tendon, you say tenosynovitis. But please look further for the whole mark of the disease. You can find that this function in thesis is emphysitis and rather than just, you know, synovitis of the tendon. Okay, I think we are going uh, further fast forward. The last type of emphysis we want to talk about in uh, some details is the nail emphysis, and then we will head to the ultrasonographic uh, picture of those. Nail emphysis is very important in rheumatology. A lot of you know this. Let's come in details. This is the middle phalanx. This is the distal phalanx. And this is the joint, the DIP joint. This should be lined by synovium. What is this here? Well, this is the extensor tendon inserting in the DIP. So again, that extensor tendon in thesis here is a vascular, but it is in close proximity with the synovium lining of the DIP joint. Okay? synovio enthesial complex. Not only this, there is an extension from the tendon called superficial lamina that comes here holding the nail. Look at this image here on the right. This is the extensor tendon insertion. Then a fibrous lamina comes to hold the nail and comes to cover the bone under the nail bed. So this is the nail bed. And there is a, a, a and there is a collagen fibers here. So whatever here is an extension of fibrous tissue from the extensor tendon in thesis, holding the nail and inserting on the bone, 
fibers in between. Not only this, this is the extensor side, but also we found that there is a dense connective tissue linking this side all together with the flexor side from the other part, this flexor tendon on the other part. And this explains why 12 years ago when I was in Spain, when we did not found when we did not find inflammation in this in thesis, we turned to the flexor side of the tendon and we assumed if we found flexor side, because this is a little bigger and easier to see with ultrasounds 12 years ago, which was not very, very high frequency. So we assumed if you have an inflammation in the distal enthesis in the flexor tendon, that this presents inflammation of the extensor tendon enthesis and nail enthesis, and this is very, very important. Now look at this nail bed. This is the nail. This is the nail bed. This is the bone in the distal phalanx, and this is the DIP joint. This, is look, this looks uniform, and if you put Doppler signal, you will only have some Doppler signal in the nail bed, distal to the insertion of the tendon. The tendon is supposed to come this side and insert here. And then the nail starts, this is the nail and the nail bed. And the nail bed will have some Doppler. This is the normal nail. What about the abnormal nail? Well, the abnormal nail will have thickened area in the grayscale. It is not uniform in the thickness anymore. And then if you put a Doppler, you will find extensive Doppler in the nail bed and then Doppler along the extensor in thesis and extensor tendon. This is what we call extensor tendon enthesitis, nail uh, enthesitis. This is very pathognomonic and could be the only sign in psoriasis patient proving that these patients will develop psoriatic arthritis and that you would better uh, intervene early. This is very, very, very important. I have a friend of mine. He used to know that he has psoriasis, but he told me one day, I cannot, uh, I have a problem with this uh, uh, joint and suddenly I cannot bend and I see with the ultrasound and then he has enthesitis. He was referred to me not by himself. He did not come to me because he has psoriasis. He thought he has a problem with the bone and indeed he has. He went to the orthopedic surgeon. He discovered that he ruptured the extensor tendon and this was his first presentation. He used to have psoriasis and not care about it small here and there and everything. And then this is first presentation, rupture of the tendon. If he told me he has psoriasis, I would have told him, come, let's check the five or six areas of the important synovial uh, um, uh, enthesis and the nail enthesis, and we could have detected this earlier and intervened earlier. Let's come to some in terminology. What is enthesitis? Enthesitis is a term very limited now to be used only in inflammation of the enthesis and mainly in the spondyloarthritis. So before, long, long years of before, we used to, to use it collectively, but now it's only confined to the inflammation of the enthesis and mostly in the spondyloarthritis. While enthesopathy is a broader term used in every time of every type of affection of the uh, enthesis. So it could be metabolic, traumatic, degenerative, sport injuries, whatever it is. So that's to say this enthesopathy is a bigger term and a bigger circle co containing all types of degenerative, mechanical and metabolic and also the inflammatory type. What is the enthesis importance in rheumatology again? Well, we have high frequency of abnormal peripheral enthesis in the spondyloarthritis. This is high frequency. And this is found in all types of spondyloarthritis. Because, you know, this is spondyloarthritis sometimes is explained uh, uh, for, for one entity like uh, axial uh, disease, for example, the, the ankylosing. Some people would consider the non-radiographic ankylosing as a pre-stage of the radiographic ankylosing. And some people say it's two stages of one disease. But not all non-radiographic uh, ankylosing will develop radiographic ankylosing. So we will need to uh, survey the, the peripheral skeleton to find out any confirmation. And also, 
across the other types of peripheral in the spondyloarthritis that have uh, 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 uveitis, uh, that have uh, 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 association with the inflammatory bowel disease, uh, juvenile, uh, uveitis, undifferentiated, uh, or the psoriatic type. Uh, those are mainly peripheral, but they are not void of central affection. Uh, but we need to see that is something is common across the whole spectrum, a peripheral enthesitis. It is common across the whole spectrum. Okay, so we have moved from, it is present in high frequency in spondylo. It is present in all types of spondylo. It could be the only and earlier sign of all spondylo. So it might be the only finding early in the disease. Monitoring of the enthesitis could be used to evaluate treatment progress in spondylo. This is given. Also, in theses are frequently involved uh, in many other mechanical issues, like sport injuries, like overuse related. So we need to differentiate between metabolic and degenerative and between enthesitis or inflammation. Also, enthesopathies are the underlying lesions in many regional pair syndromes. Why and how? We have just explained that enthesis is an organ and pain and tenderness might um, radiate to not, not only radiate, would affect an earlier segment of the tendon. So it can be a whole region, and the reason would be only one point. Do you want an example? Take this example. Clinically, when we examine the lateral part of the hip at the greater trochanter and we put our finger, we used to say trochanteric bursitis. With the introduction of this ultra anatomy and the ultrasound, we rarely see bursitis. We seldom see it. We see it less often than enthesitis, bone issue, tendon issue, enthesitis. Do you have a prototype for this patient? Female, middle age, might be a little obese, might be, and complaining of a pain that is radiating to the gluteal region and pain that is radiating down to the knee and probably radiating to the ilium and iliac spine. And if you push the greater trochanter, it would be very painful. When you examine everything with ultrasound, you can indeed find some pathology in, in other areas, like sciatica, like what we used to say pyriformis syndrome, or the deep gluteal pain syndrome, or iliotibial band, or, 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 but sometimes it's the only area, greater trochanter, that has the primary pathology of the enthesis radiating in the region. So these regional syndromes are very, very important. This is not the complex regional pain syndrome. This is not it. We are talking about regional pain syndromes, syndromes of pain, okay? I will not go through the spondylo in details, but look at the axial criteria of the spa and you will find enthesitis, okay? Look at the peripheral criteria of the spa and you will find enthesitis. Look at the other features that should be included, enthesitis. So, enthesitis is a whole mark of the spondylo, whether in the central or the peripheral. And you will, I know you will ask me, how the central? This will come probably uh, in the spondylo uh, presentation or pre uh, spondylo lecture. Now, as we used to say as well in the rheumatoid arthritis, the early diagnosis is very important. We have to intervene very early because the, sp the, the, the rheumatoid is deforming. Now we know that the spondyloarthritis is deforming as well, and that look at these findings when we have a delayed outcome. Erosions are increased. Arthritis mutilans are increased. Those are deforming. If you increase more than six months uh, in the diagnosis, this is very likely to happen. Okay, do you need to know what is the median or average age for diagnosing those spondyloarthritis? especially the, uh, the important ones, one whole year, one whole year. So after a year, you did not only develop erosions or deformities, you might be having wasted chance to have a good control of the disease. If you diagnose and control the disease early, you have a better chance to control the disease with biologics and also to prevent complications. I don't want to go through the details of spondylo because now we are talking about the uh, enthesitis. 
Look at this area where we have the patellar tendon normally extended between the patella and the tibia while this tendon is there. The tendon, I, I confirm to you, I can see it in the screen, intact, but how can we describe it? Oh, it's very much thickened, it's irregular in the contour, doesn't have an outline well demarcated, it's losing the fibrillar echo pattern, it's hypoechoic in the image. Hmm? So this is tendinopathy. What if you, if you put Doppler signal? Bear in mind for something we are going to talk about now. The, the Doppler signal is happening in the tendon and not in the enthesis. Again, here, in the tendon and not in the enthesis. One thing that is very important to us. So this is tendinopathy. Also here, we have Achilles and the pre-insertional because we don't even see the calcaneus here. We are very proximal. This is a fusiform swelling with Doppler signal in and around, losing the fibril pattern, very localized site. This is degenerative, might be metabolic, but it's not inflammatory. With the Doppler signal. So don't confuse Doppler signal in a tendon for inflammation. Also, this is the Doppler signal in the transverse view in and around. So this is peritendonitis. And we have, uh, we have explained this in detail in uh, one of the chapters with uh, Springer in, in, in a book. We are uh, talking about this soft tissue changes. This was Achilles normal and then different types of Achilles tendon affection with tendinopathy and peritendonitis. And what is the difference and how can we differentiate this to enthesitis? Now, how would, look, how would the abnormal enthesis look in ultrasound? Well, let's take some history and go up and up. First of all, the Omer Act Committee in the EULA decided in 2005 that it would be an abnormal, what is enthesitis, an abnormal hypoechoic, meaning losing the fibrilla architecture, and or thickened tendon or ligament in its bony attachment that may occasionally contain hyperechoic foci consistent with calcification. Okay, seen in two perpendicular planes and may exhibit Doppler signal or and or bony changes, including enthesophyte, erosions, or irregularities. So let's take it step by step. First of all, this is 2005. This was the first time. Hypoechoic or thickened tendon that might be having calcification seen in two planes. You might be having a Doppler and or chronic bony changes that are enthesophytes, erosions, or irregularities. Okay, what happened after this? Well, in 2014, in the Euler, we have done a, a Delphi survey, and a lot of people had an agreement that was excellent on hypoechogenicity, increased thickness of the tendon, calcification, enthesophytes, erosions, Doppler activity as elementary lesions of enthesitis. Unfortunately, they did not have an agreement on bursitis or tendinitis as elementary component. I am very sad about this bursitis, but what can we say? I actually voted for it, but some others didn't. So uh, now we don't consider the bursitis and tendinitis as elementary components. They might be supportive, but not elementary, meaning we have to see these elements. Let's have a journey looking at these elements. Okay. In 2014 and after, we, the Omer Act defined the hypoechogenicity as lack of homogeneous fibrillar pattern and the increased thickness of the tendon to be at the insertion and divided those enthesophyte calcification and erosion into structural change. And why do we say this? Because these structural changes might be difficult to treat, might not regress after treatment. So don't confine, don't confuse them when you see them in a chronic patient that this is activity. It might be just a chronicity rather than activity. And they confined the Doppler signal to less than two millimeter near the bony cortex. So the Doppler in the tendon anywhere is not considered enthesitis, it's considered tendinopathy. And the Doppler signal must be at the enthesis, not an artifact, not a nutrient artery, not without, uh, sorry, with or without cortical irregularities or erosions. 
let's come to this Achilles area here where you have the insertion and look at this Achilles tendon. We are talking about hypoechogenicity. Is this hypoechogenic? Of course. This is even the one here is hypoechogenic, but the one around peritendinopathy and the one here is hypoechogenicity of the tendon. Let's look at this one. This is normal Achilles th th uh, thickness, but this one shows marked Achilles at thickness at the insertion, not proximate. We are not talking about tendinopathy. We're talking about increased thickness at the insertion. Okay, look at this in thesophyte. So we have the bone here pre-insertional, insertional, then suddenly hyperechoic band elevated with back shadow consistent with continuity of the bone. So this is in thesophyte. What about these hyperechoic spots in the distal insertion of the tendon at the enthesis? These are calcifications. They might be having back shadow here, they might not be having back shadow here. Both are normal. Okay, this is all normal. This is calcification. This is enthesophyte. So this is consistent with a bone continuation. This is consistent with a, a change in the tendon. This is also another example of calcification in the Achilles transverse view. Hyperechoic spots and not having back shadow. And this is the, uh, the calcaneus bone. Now, the calcification itself is a complicated issue. I don't want to go through the details today. There is three types of calcification or three phases of calcification, or let's say it's a two phases of calcification, formative and the resorptive. And this formative has two types. And one has uh, when do you have back shadow and when do you don't have it. It's a little bit of details. But what I'm telling you is, not all calcification will have back shadow. Be careful to differentiate calcification from enthesophyte. Of course, to have uh, an erosion at the insertion, this is very characteristic of spondyloarthritis. So here you have the, the uh, erosion. Here you have the erosion. This is transverse. This is longitudinal. And as you can see, you have also supportive factors. Thickened, hypoechoic, losing fibrillar pattern, erosion, nearby bursitis. Here the bursitis acted as supportive, but remember we don't consider it an elementary lesion. And if you put the vascularity, you can find Doppler signal in the tendon, in the peritendon, and in the distal insertion, and even in the erosion, and in the bursa. So it's all erosion, in the bursa, and in the tendon. This is the tendon vascularity. Of course, the bursitis, I wish I could say, but this is not an elementary region, but at least it's very supportive in this case. And you can see this is a zero negative disease, spondyloarthritis with all the hallmarks of the disease in the ultrasound and the bursitis here is supportive, very supportive. In the transverse view, the bursa can be much appreciated than the longitudinal view and it would look like this. Uh, sometimes you see it very small here, so it is not suggestive of inflammatory arthritis. So acute and chronic enthesopathy. In the acute enthesopathy, you can find non-structural or potentially reversible changes. What are these? Hypoechogenicity of the thickening of the tendon, tendon thickening, and Doppler signal. Those are completely reversible, and you will see later some cases before and after. But in chronic cases, you might find erosions, enthesophytes, and calcifications. These are primary bone changes, primarily chronic changes, primarily irreversible. But you can find people having reversible erosions or improved uh, erosions, but it is not uh, a, a rule that we can depend on. Now, also the clinical versus the subclinical sign of uh, enthesitis, because the same entity in the rheumatoid that uh, proves that subclinical uh, synovitis is present and can be present early and can be the good sign of the pre uh, disease progression and can uh, depict the, the, the prog progression of the disease. And you can decide based on it, the biological therapy endpoints or the continuation of the treatment. The same for enthesitis. We have found some subclinical enthesitis and that they can be very early and can be asymptomatic and can be diagnostic 
and can follow be followed up and can form a way to uh, control our uh, endpoints for the biologics. Here is different types of indices, and here is the difference between the clinical uh, ability to detect abnormalities in the anthesis and the blue ultrasound ability to detect abnormality in the anthesis. And it is very clear that the ultrasound is superior than the clinical examination in detecting those anthesial abnormalities and in other studies proved to be of a significant relevance. Now, what are the indices uh, for the anthesopathy? The indices for the anthesopathy, um, we, will, we will detect a few of them or take a few of them to talk about because they are so many. First of all, we have so many clinical indices for anthesis and so many ultrasound uh, indices uh, uh, for, in, for anthesitis. So I will speak about only two today, most important. The one that involves only grayscale is called guest score, and the one that incorporates power Doppler is called Messi score or Madrid score. So let's talk about uh, those scores. Now the Glasgow or the guest score is developed by Peter Ballant. He is uh, my professor, my uh, friend. He comes from Hungary and he was, uh, uh, he was at Glasgow at that time and he developed this score very early for the system. So he took the patellar tendon, the, uh, uh, sorry, the quadriceps tendon, the, the proximal patellar, the distal patellar tendon, the, plantar, the Achilles tendon, and the plantar fascia. Each one of them had a score for the tendon thickness, the bursitis, the erosion, and the osteophytes. Of course, in some areas, there was no bursa, so there was no scoring period. And he put a cut of value for the thickness at the insertion that might be considered thickened or not. So one point if the tendon is thickened, one point if we have bursitis, one point, one point if we have erosion, one point if we have enthesophyte. And you count all these points for one, two, three, four, five areas, and then you do the other limb, the lower limb as well, and then these are two uh, scores for the two lower limbs, and you sum together forming a possible score for 36 points. This is the guess score or the Glasgow uh, score. Now let's talk about the Madrid score. First of all, Madrid score is more recent. Madrid score is not only grayscale score, it involves also Doppler signal. And Madrid score also involves one in thesis from the upper limb, upper limb. Listen, upper limb. Why? Remember at the beginning of the presentation, we have mentioned a lot of things about in thesis and BMI, in thesis and body weight, in thesis and lower limb, in thesis and mechanical strain. This enthesopathy is centrally pivoting around mechanical strain. We have proved this, that the lower limb is more affected, obese patients are more affected, all patients with enthesopathy uh, get better when they unload themselves with non-weight bearing, when they rest at home. So we added to this that the, the olecranon tuberosity for the triceps tendon in thesis. And indeed, you might scan some people with skin psoriasis only, and you find one big erosion here that can give you a sign that the, this patient has enthesitis. So, Another change is the scoring system also involves some grading, not only zero and one for bursitis and the Doppler, but also the Doppler and erosion zero to three. So zero, one, two, three, and not only zero or one, not only absent or present. Of course, adding upper limb uh, uh, in thesis and adding grading to the score ended up to have uh, a sensitivity and the specificity of 83%, which is very much excellent score if you have a cutoff value of 18. So if you count the scoring system and you take the cutoff value of 18, above this would be uh, enthesitis, sensitivity and specificity 80 something percent is actually excellent. So 
And of course, I will not be giving a lot of details. This, these details are mentioned in the, in the presentation or the lecture for the Spondilo, where how to use the score and how to follow up with, and a lot of details. Why a lot of details? Because it has been found that these scores in the peripheral enthesis are linked to the development of central affection, axial affection, the inflammatory process and osteitis in the bone. Okay, Be why? Because I have mentioned quickly that part of the difference of the prime of the uh, 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 peripheral axial skeleton, uh, peripheral skeleton uh, synovial enthesial enthesis is different from the central uh, enthesis. First, central enthesis, no, we don't have synovial enthesial complex. We, uh, we have a little bit rare myeloid uh, cells. We have little bit rare affection of interleukin-23 and it's not effective. And one of the reasons also, the synovial enthesial peripheral one will have a nearby synovial inflammation, whereas in the central or the axial affection, we will be having osteitis mainly predominantly in the nearby. Yeah? And this osteitis seen by ultrasound, uh, sorry, by MRI, and it will develop syndesmophytes later. And whether or not uh, this will happen late and how late, it is detected and correlated by those peripheral synovial uh, enthesial uh, uh, scoring systems. I don't want to go further for this, but uh, I want to uh, see to show you how we use the ultrasound for the management and the follow up. This is a transverse uh, um, Achilles tendon with erosion. And here is the longitudinal image I showed you before with erosion, thickening, hypoechoic image, edema, losing the fibrillar echo pattern and the nearby uh, bursitis. And if you put the Doppler signal, you can confirm that the Doppler is close, less than two millimeter from the bone, inside the erosion, and at the tendon, in the bursa, and uh, in the uh, proximal tendon as well. So this is a form of enthesitis in the spondyloarthritis. And this is how it looks like in the grayscale and in the Doppler signal before treatment. And this is how it looks like after treatment. So the thickening of the tendon is much, much reduced now. We are gaining, this is edema and losing the fibrillar echo pattern. We are now gaining again the fibrillar echo pattern of the tendon. Even the erosion was less in the size. And uh, this one with the Doppler signal, the Doppler signal is much reduced in the tendon and it disappeared completely from the erosion and completely from the bone line, defy, defying the uh, recent uh, definition for uh, Doppler enthesitis. So this is a, a very good example how uh, it looks like. Now, uh, monitoring the response uh, to therapy using uh, enthesitis assessment was found to be correlating, uh, whether to the NSAIDs, local injections, uh, biological DMARs, TNF blockers, and uh, so forth. Uh, in 2008, it was also seen to be correlating in the SPA with the uh, reversal, even those erosions like the case I, saw, I show you, uh, because we have said earlier that uh, erosions, abnormalities in the bone, anticipates might not come back. But in some uh, young patients where you only have erosions, some of those erosions are reversible. And then this is the ultrasound is a useful and sensitive tool in the assessment and uh, follow up of those spa patients. And uh, in another uh, study by Naredo later, it was found that the inflammatory lesions will show significant improvement, but uh, the chronic lesions will show uh, worsening despite the TNF therapy. And that's why I warned you, don't depend on the chronic changes of endosopathy. And this will be a dilemma in case of people above 55 years of age, where most of us will have enthesophytes. So you cannot really depend on this as a sign of enthesitis or even a previous enthesitis. This can be only a sign of degenerative disease. So you have to evaluate very carefully in people above 55. Uh, also, the Doppler ultrasound will provide a reliable estimation and monitor of the therapeutic response to the TNF blockers in ankylosing. Uh, ankylosing. See the peripheral fibrocartilaginous enthesis. Uh, let's review some concepts today. Entheses are complex anatomical structures frequently affected by various diseases, not only peripheral uh, spa, but also axial spa, and remember this very well. 
active enthesopathy has increased thickness and hypoecogenicity of the tendons, together with a positive Doppler th thickness. Enthesitis is a key feature of all SPA. Uh, enthesis could be assessed by sonographic uh, ultrasound in detail. The chronic enthesopathy, like calcifications, erosions, and enthesopites, mean previous inf uh, inflammation, uh, but can be found in degenerative in older age. In younger age, you have to be uh, uh, relating them to the inflammation. But these are chronic affection, and there might not be reversible. The sonographic enthesis could be used to monitor treatment in spondyloarthritis. And uh, those are some uh, few books I participated in with uh, uh, Springer that you can find a good, very good reference with uh, uh, talking about in thesis. This is a, 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 um, a chapter about soft tissue rheumatism, showing a lot uh, of uh, tendinopathy, peritendinitis, and enthesitis changes. This is uh, osteoarthritis that can show also some enthesitis in children because. Um, uh, the, of the affection of osteoarthritis. This is the, sorry, this was the one of the knee and leg, and it was a pediatric ultrasound, and we have mentioned about the different types of enthesitis affected children around the knee, because the knee is very important. The knee, you have three entheses around the knee and two around the ankle, so these are two very, very important joints. I was very happy and honored by you listening to me and following up today. These are my references, the Facebook group, Muscoskeletal Ultrasound of Egypt, the YouTube channel, Dr. Adham One Word. This is my email, and this is my photography through the plane, which I hope one day will uh, take coming to you uh, in your countries, wherever you are. Thank you very much, my friend, Jack, and for will, uh, uh, inviting me today, and I am open to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adham. It's a very interesting and very comprehensive lecture. Uh, in fact, this is uh, the first time I ever heard a very lengthy discussion on uh, in pieces. It's really opened a lot of uh, knowledge to uh, all of us. Now, there's a question here. Uh, it's about uh, the Madrid score in the diagnosis of spondylar arthropathies. So, uh, Dr. Mervat is asking the, the value of the Madrid score in uh, using for the diagnosis for spondylar arthropathies. <laughs> okay, let me, uh, let me share, because I, I already said that uh, this is discussed in another uh, lecture, but since she asked, I will go uh, quickly uh, for the uh, spondylo, um, spondylo arthritis. It, this, this is, uh, Uh, what we do, uh, Dr. Mervet, is we prepare a paper with a table and we prepare the five entheses and then um, uh, we put scoring system 0, 1, 2, 3 for the Doppler and the erosions and 0, 1 for the others and then you examine the patient quickly, maybe in 5 to 10 minutes you are finished and then you put 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3 and then you uh, evaluate the summation of these and then if they pass through 18, then this is suggestive of uh, spondyl. Let me... Um, uh, put you this. So uh, it is important also to say that in a spondylo, especially in the psoriatic, uh, the, the six domains, there are four that you can show with ultrasound very clearly, enthesitis, bactylitis, sinusitis, and uh, phenocytitis. Now, when we come to the enthesis scoring, uh, Uh, 
هنا دي الديتيلز اهي these are the oh sorry let me first uh, try to share with the meeting Um, I cannot go back to the meeting. What happened? Oh, here it is. Screen sharing, and it would be this one. Share. So, um, like I told you, these are the. Uh, the Madrid score. The scoring system for the tendons or the bursitis would be zero or one. And uh, the power Doppler erosion and erosions would be zero to three. And the calcification would be zero to three. So again, you put extra pole one, two, three, four, five, six. We have mentioned three uh, in thesis around the knee, two around the ankle, and one is the triceps. So this is six rather than five and one in the upper limb rather than all lower limb. And also we put Doppler signal rather than all grayscale. And also the bursitis and tendon will have zero one, but the Doppler, the erosion and the calcification will be having zero to three. And then you put a table and you put zero one to three, zero one to three for all the joints, for all the thesis. And then you submit, you calculate. If you exceed 18, then you are very sure that this is synovitis. Now, the application is that the Madrid can differentiate psoriatic arthritis from psoriasis. And that there is no difference if the BMI is above 30. Why do we say this? Because in the, um, in the uh, GUESS score or the Glasgow score, there was a correlation with BMI. This GUESS score, there was a correlation with BMI. And it was very well known that Achilles thickness and BMI association has been privately, uh, previously re reported. This is the very important point that a higher in thesis scoring detected by the GESS score uh, is an involvement of joints using both grayscale and Doppler uh, is predictive of the development of psoriatic arthritis in patients with sole psoriasis. This is what I wanted to share with you. Now, the affection, it comes like this. The higher the Madrid score associated with peripheral joint, uh, damage, joint ankylosis, and arthritis mutilans. So this scoring is very important. And also, the greater the axial damage. I explained this briefly when I was talking. This is not only important to diagnose patients with psoriatic arthritis who has only psoriasis, but also important to identify patients with only enthesitis when they don't have any uh, clinical picture. I hope now you understand how we use the uh, scoring uh, system. Uh, I will look uh, at the, the chat to check the, the questions. Okay, how can we use the Madrid score? We have finished this. Um, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, For those, ah, oh, oh, this is my question. Okay, great, uh, great lecture. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, uh, the other question is, uh, uh, what if you see, because sometimes when we do ultrasound, we also see some of these changes, but not necessarily in a psoriatic arthritis or spondyloarthropathies. So what is the implication if we see these uh, similar changes in, let's say in Achilles tendon, a lot of times, Times we see the Achilles tendon. So what? What, is the, what does that mean? I will do a, a form of algorithm or a triage. For example, uh, if the patient is young and there is no reason to think about uh, degenerative changes in Achilles and thesis, uh, and you have those changes in young patient, then we are talking about inflammatory changes. The other entity is if you're having young or old with inflammatory picture like Doppler at the bone, erosions, uh, enthesitis true of inflammation, then this will take us to the inflammation side. So we are talking about spondyloarthritis. 
inside the spondyloarthritis comes the criteria. If we found dactylitis and uh, nail enthesitis, then we are talking about spondylo. Uh, if, you have found, if you have found peripheral joint affection that is a sporadic, it could be only sporadic, but it could be also ankylosing or other types like the active and so forth. So comes the clinical uh, picture and comes the history to develop. But if you find those changes in uh, a mildly symptomatic, asymptomatic or even symptomatic patients at older stage, uh, those patients should not be considered uh, active inflammatory spondyloarthritis because we have to be very careful above the age of 55 in diagnosing uh, patients with uh, inflammatory changes when we only have some chronic changes at the bone. We have to be very careful to differentiate. Is it only chronic changes of the bone? The patient is above 55. The symptoms are not suggestive of acute inflammation. Okay. Good. So another question is, uh, what intervention do you do for, for a patient with, uh, with this intosopathy findings? Oh, this is a very, very, very important question, Jaikin. This is a very important question. Maybe we can spend half an hour talking about the choice of <laughs> injected <laughs> material. Okay, let me tell you this. At a lot of areas uh, we discussed of in thesis, like the fibrocartilaginous in thesis, they have very uh, much traction to it, even in the upper limb like this fibrocartilaginous incisus of the supraspinatus, it's a, it's a very important traction site. So at these areas, you have to be very careful injecting steroids. Those uh, tendons mostly don't have synovial tendon sheath. They are prone to a very uh, enforceful movements and uh, uh, tractions. So I don't recommend injecting steroids to those uh, areas. What do we inject usually? Uh, if you believe in the PRP and regenerative medicine, it would be a good choice. But if the patient is under immunosuppression or is contraindicated for PRP for other reason, a lot of those patients would uh, receive non-steroidals in the beginning for the treatment of uh, uh, spondyloarthritis. So this is contraindication of uh, PRP. Then the other alternative, it would be the uh, uh, soft tissue hyaluronic acid. Let me show you uh, this, I will, oh, um, my friend, if you allow me again to share the screen, I can show you what I uh, inject in some peripheral uh, in thesis. Yeah, you can, you can, you can show. Thank you very much. Now this is the hyaluronic acid for the soft tissue. Uh, This is it. It's a pre-filled syringe. Uh, here it's called sport vis, but it comes with two pre-filled syringes. Uh, this one is Swiss made, I think, in Asia and then uh, in Europe you can find alternatives. It's a hyaluronic acid for soft tissue with on-label indication for supraspinatus, lateral epicondyle in the, uh, in the elbow, and, um, and uh, ankle sprain for the ligaments. But off-label indications include patellar tendon, Achilles tendon, and plantar fascia, and it is very successful. What it does is you have to use ultrasound to uh, uh, inject this because you have to stick it to the tendon or the ligament. It forms a fibrin network and then it causes healing and regenerative uh, power to the uh, ligament or tendon uh, uh, injected. So this is, I found this, a very, very good one, especially for the supraspinatus and plantar fascia, where for three years I did not inject cortisone in these sites. How often do you, how often do you inject it, Dr. Adnan? Uh, it's two injections uh, in, the, in the shoulder. It's two weeks apart, uh, but in the elbow is one week apart, and in the ankle sprain is two to five days apart. I see, I see. So this is, we don't have that sports uh, type of hyaluronic here. Uh, oh. So do you have a specific molecular weight that we need to see? They, they are low molecular weight. And I have some uh, experience with uh, some colleagues from different universities where it is not available there. 
they use uh, low molecular weight intra-articular injection to imitate uh, the soft tissue. I wouldn't say that they get the same result. It is somehow successful, but of course, this is first off-label indication, and second, it is not 100% successful, the, uh, like the specialized one. I see, okay. So, any more question? We really appreciate you, Dr. Adham, for your time. Thank I you know you much. are very busy, but uh, still, you uh, really, this is a very interesting lecture. The first time I've ever heard a very comprehensive lecture just for in thesis. Uh, yeah. Although we see this also among uh, pediatric patients, and yes. very, very interesting. It's really something that uh, we look forward to. And thank you very much. And for those of you, who would like to continue uh, follow this lecture we will post this in our youtube channel and you will be able to see them and uh, you'll be able to review whatever dr adham said for today so thank you very much dr adham hope thank to see you, you ne thank next you. year yes see <laughs> you. yes thank so you God bless and take care you take too. care everyone thank you for your time and see you okay god bless thank you Bye.